Well, it is so good to be here with you all today and to think on spiritual things. You know, we have to think about earthly things all the time, don't we? I mean, there's just so much. And if we're not careful, we let these things of this world and things of the earth fill our minds where we don't have time to think of the eternal things and things of the spirit. But you're not that way because you came this morning to worship an eternal God and wanted to hear from the very word that the spirit of God gave us. That's why you've assembled this morning. And it does me good to be in your company. And I hope that when you leave, you'll feel like, yes, we accomplished that purpose. And we're able to push all these worldly things aside and zero in on really what is valuable and important. And it keeps all these things in perspective. And that's what we're going to be doing as we look at the book of Psalms this morning. What I try to do is begin every month the first Sunday morning of that month going into the book of Psalms. And so if all things go as we plan, that means in uh, October we'll be going into the 40th Psalm and we'll just continue that as we work ourselves through the Psalms. And we've come to the 39th Psalm. Now, the title up there comes from the body of that Psalm. The measure of my days. I know those of you that build things measure things. You probably have a tape measure or something or some kind of kind of line to measure, and you have to. And things are finite. They're not infinite. When we talk about measuring our days, that tells us that there's only a certain number of them that someday we're going to come to the end of that tape measure and that, that's going to be the last day because our days on this world are numbered. Now, that's what this psalm is going to be about. I know that a lot of people, you know, we're going to feel like we've spent some time in the book of Ecclesiastes by the time we get through this psalm. In fact, I tell you, the other day, the lady told me, she said, I like to read the book of Ecclesiastes because that's true. <laughs> well, of course, the Bible's true, and it is true. But the book of Ecclesiastes is about how that this life, if you just put all your focus on things under the sun, well, you're going to be disappointed. It is vanity. But there's so much more in store for us. And some people find that depressing. But if you are spiritual, spiritually minded, that's not depressing. It is sobering, but it's not depressing. And it focuses our minds on eternity. There's another psalm that has an expression similar to this. The 90th Psalm. Psalm 90 and verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. If we would be wise, we would remember that our days are numbered, that there's a lot more to living than this life. If we forget that, we'll live a life of foolishness. But if we will remember that, we will be wise. And I think of Methuselah. Now, Methuselah, he lived 969 years. So I got my calculator out and multiplied by 365 and one four. 365.25. And you can come up with 353,928 days on his birthday. That was his last birthday. Now, he lived a few more days after that, but not many. And the thing is, as many as that is, they were still numbered. You could count them. You cannot count days in eternity where they don't measure time by days. They count not 
time by days when there is no night there. Remember that song? Well, that's the difference in this life and the eternal life that is to come. Now, let's look at this. There's several things. And I'm going to get off subject now, but this is important. This psalm has an inscription. In the King James Version, this is what it says. To the chief musician. Now, we're used to that because these psalms are musical compositions. <coughs> and it's a psalm of David. In fact, so many of the psalms are psalms of David. They just, some of them call, these are the psalms of David. Now, all of them were written by David, but this one was. But then it says, under Jaduthin. It's the first time we came across that in the psalms. And you probably have no idea what that is. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. Because we read about Juduthan in the scriptures. It's when David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He talks about Obed-Edom, also the sons of Juduthan and Hosea will be porters. That means they're the gatekeepers. There he is. And Juduthan is involved in, the, in leading the musical worship of, for, for David. In verse 41, 1 Chronicles 16, 41, And with them Heman and Juduthan, and they that were chosen, who were expressed by name to give thanks to the Lord because his mercy endureth forever. And then with them Heman and Juduthan, with trumpets and cymbals, for those that should make a sound and with musical instruments of God. And the sons of Juduthan were porters. They would play these musical instruments and they kept the gate. That's not the only place we read about him. Look at here. First Chronicles 25, 1 through 6. It talks about moreover David and the captain of the host separated the sons of Asaph with Heman and Juduthan. Now look what they did. They prophesied with harps and with psalteries and with cymbals. It wasn't just a, an aid to their worship. They prophesied with these things. This was part of their worship. And in verse 3, the sons of Jeduthun, it talks about uh, six under the hands of their father who prophesied with a harp and gave thanks and praise unto the Lord. Here they are again for a song in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with psalteries and harps. Well, Juduthan was, well, he was in the band. I mean, they would worship with a band. Harps and cymbals and psalteries. We read about blowing trumpets and all these things. There are those today that would go back and look at that and say, well, we ought to use instruments in the church when we worship. But they weren't in the church. This had to do with the, the, the worship under the old law with the priest and the bringing in of the ark and the tabernacle and the temple. And he wasn't telling us how to worship in the church when he did that. Those, those former things are done away. We find out how to worship God in his church by seeing how they worshiped in the church in the New Testament. And they did a lot of things in the worship of the Old Testament. And I'm glad we don't have to do that. I'm glad we don't have to slay a lamb out here this morning and have burnt off. Wouldn't that be a mess every Sunday to have to do all that? That was the, the rudiments of this world in that worship. But now the worship is more spiritual than it was then. But, but I thought that was interesting because that's where, why his name is in this inscription. Now let's get to the psalm itself. To begin with the psalm, David didn't want to say anything. He, he really didn't know what to say. And he's afraid he might say the wrong thing. You ever felt like that? He says, I said, I'll take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with the bridle while the wicked is before me. Have you ever done this? I've, I've kept my mouth with the bridle. I've used this bridle right here. And I have just, 
I'm going to say the wrong thing if I say something and I'm just I'm just not going to say anything because <laughs> I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing it is so easy to sin with the tongue talking about keeping the tongue with the bridle that reminded me of James 3 2 through 3 if any man offend not in word the same as a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body Oh, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Every kind of beast and every birds and serpents and things of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed to mankind. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes the best thing to do is just, just, just don't say anything. And David's afraid he's going to say the wrong thing. We sing that song, don't we? Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. We need to keep our tongue under control. And so he just sat there. You know, if you don't say anything, you don't say anything good either, though. David just couldn't stand it. Here's, look how the psalm goes. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me. And while I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. It's like, I tell you, sometimes it's wise to be silent. But in that silent, we can govern our thoughts and figure out what we should say. And then we can say things for good. And it got to where David, I just can't be quiet about this anymore. Uh, you felt that way, haven't you? I know you have. I felt that way. He's not the only one. Elihu in Job. Job 32, 18 through 20. I'm full of the matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as a wine that hath no vent. It's ready to burst like new bottles. I'll speak that I may be refreshed. I just can't be quiet about it. I'm going to say something. And then here in Jeremiah 20 in verse 9, I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary with forbear. I could not stay. I can't hold it back anymore. And then I thought of Paul in the New Testament. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon ye. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Sometimes we just got to say something. Now bridle your tongue, get it under control. But, but I got to say something. And when David began to speak, he spoke to the Lord in prayer. Look at the next verse. Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days. Now that's the title. What it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man in his best state is altogether vanity, Sheila. Doesn't that just sound like the book of Ecclesiastes? All is vanity. And a hand breath. How, how long is your life? Well, here's a hand breath. Put your thumb up on your hand and look at your four fingers. That's it. Not very, that's not very long. It's not very long. I mean, you think how long eternity is. It just disappears, doesn't it? It's, all, it's almost nothing. My days pass just that fast. There's a measure to those days. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 4, or 2 in verse 14, one event happeneth to them all. That's talking about death. Joshua 23, 14, in 2 Kings 2, 2, the way of all the earth. That's what death is called there. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto all men once to die. James 4, 4, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeared for a little time and vanisheth away. I like to get up and walk in the mornings and often in the mornings there's vapor across the landscape. There's a fog. Oh, it's beautiful. I'll get out walking and see that, but you know, as soon as the sun comes up without me hardly realizing it, all of a sudden it's gone. That's what happens to life. 
It just gets right away from you. You can measure the days to the end. Now, we don't know when that end is, but it's not far out there. It's a hand breath. And when it's all over, they'll be able to put on your tombstone, the tombstone, the day you were born and the day you passed, and they'll be able to count how many days that was if they want to take time to count them. Well, David said, we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. By reason of strength, they be four score, yet their strength is labor and sorrow. The sun cut off and we fly away. Psalm 39, verse 6. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Boy, don't we see that. People put on such a show in their life, and it's empty. It's going to be over. The curtain's going to close. We walk our life in a vain show. Surely they're disquieted in vain. Why are we all so disturbed about things in this world? It, it, it's going to pass. It'll all be over. Heap up riches. We don't know who shall gather them. You know, when we leave it, we leave it all, don't we? Who's, who's that going to be when I'm gone? And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. If you don't have a hope in the Lord, if you're putting your hope in the things of this life, it's just all vanity. But not if you have your hope in God. And we sing about that hope. We love singing about that. Build your hope on things eternal. Hold the God's unchanging hand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. Some build their hopes on the ever-drifting sand. Some on their fame or their, or their uh, fortune or, or their pleasures or their land. Mine's on the rock that forever shall stand. My hope is in thee. That changes our whole perspective on life and the things of this life because our hope we've got to deal with living here but this is not where we put our hopes my hopes in thee and so prepare for eternity deliver me from all my transgressions that's what we got to do we're going to that judgment day in eternity, and we want to be delivered from our transgressions. Make not the may, make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb, I opened not mouth because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. Now watch this. I'm consumed by the blow of thy hand. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Sheila. You ever try to catch a moth, catch a pretty moth, catch him? You get him and you open your hand, your hand's full of dust, and you've marred the beauty, and it just consumes away like a moth. And we suffer things in this life. And God chastises us. <laughs> And it's a blessing because it takes our mind. You, in the midst of your suffering, it takes your mind off of this passing world. And we zero in on eternity. And that's the blessing that comes from the Lord's reproach. He's doing a quit thinking about this world. This world is not going to be here for you. Quit thinking. Think about eternity and prepare for eternity. And that's what the blows of life will teach us to do. Anything we suffer that causes us to draw nearer to God is a blessing for us. Though it may be hard for the time, it's a blessing. And so verse 12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my cry, hold not thy peace at my tears. That's one of the most beautiful lines in this psalm. Look how it starts off. Hear my prayer. It's not just a prayer, it's a cry. 
Give ear to my cry. I held my peace, but you hold not your peace at my tears. We've gone from a prayer to cry to tears. Have you done that? I bet you have. If you haven't and you live a while, you will. You'll go to God in prayer. You'll come out of that prayer in tears because you've been crying. I've heard those tears called liquid prayers. Isn't that a beautiful way that he builds that right into there? And he says, I'm a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. That's what we think about going through this world here. We're strangers here. The fathers were. Look what Abraham said. Genesis 23 and verse 4. He's the father. I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. That's what he said to the sons of Heth. That's after Sarah died. I tell you, someone you love and they pass from you. You feel like a stranger on this world. That's how Abraham felt. And we know that because of what we read in the New Testament. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. They confess they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from which they came out, they may have had opportunity to have returned, but now they desire better country. That is in heavenly. Wherefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared for them a city. That, that's where we're headed. We're just, we're, we're the wandering through this world as strangers with a home in heaven. And in the New Testament... 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, Peter writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, I know, I know. The Jews were scattered all over the world. And so he's writing to those Jews that have been scattered to the world. But he's writing to Christians here, and there's a spiritual element in this. It's not just strangers because of the geography, but because of the spiritual world. We're strangers here. Because he refers to it again in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. We're strangers. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And so he says in verse 13, Oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. When I read that, I thought of my daddy. We thought we'd lost him to COVID. He, he wanted to live. And now he's past that. He has been spared. And I'll tell you what he's doing on uh, Thursday nights at age 92. He's teaching a class for the Middle Tennessee School of Preaching and Biblical Studies on the non-writing prophets. He was spared. Paul said, I'm in a strait betwixt the two. For I want to be here with you, but it'd be far better to depart and be with Christ. But I still have work I want to do with you. So spare us, Lord, through these tough times. Spare us so that we might serve thee that's why we would want to be spared. But well, we've got a hope of things better. In Tennyson's Ulysses, he has Odysseus say, Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all. But something ere the end, some noble work of note may yet be done if we're spared. If we're spared, how are we going to use those days that have been spared for us? We're going to use them in service of the Lord, aren't we? And do some noble work of note for our God. 
Ecclesiastes 12, verses 5, 7, and 13. A man goeth to his long home. That's the grave. That's the vault. You'll be shoved in there, laid out. It's going to be your long home for that body. But then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave him. And so Solomon says, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. No, that is not depressing. That is a sobering. But that fills life with meaning and purpose. And we know how to take all the, the whips and scorns of life because we've got a hope on beyond in eternity. Now, do you have that hope? Do you have that hope? What about your transgressions? Are you ready for that day to come? And we can be forgiven of all those transgressions. We, we can go to that judgment with boldness and confidence. Our Lord died on the cross for us. We'll come to Him on His terms. All that's over. And we have a joy in looking ahead. So, you need to respond to the invitation while we stand and sing, Obey the Lord, the gospel of Jesus Christ, baptized unto Him, and then live that life for Him. So we stand and sing.